Hiya folks, Carl James here from Electric Media Madness. Joining me for another episode of Insightful, I have a very special guest with me today, Mark Devlin. How are you doing, sir? Hello, mate. Yeah, quite tired, <laughs> busy as ever. Always am. Lots going on. Yeah, I'm travelling all over the place, haven't you? It's uh, It's been fascinating well, lately, watching what you've been up to, yeah. Yeah, lately I've moved house, uh, been to Las Vegas for a weekend, and been to Australia for a week. So if I look a bit tired and jet-lagged, it's because I am. <laughs> so all of that has been in a really short space of time got to yeah. move again in a few weeks as well uh so yeah it's all happening i'm sure our um viewers and listeners will be uh, will not mind because it's about the content isn't it as opposed to uh, well yeah i was saying like, to you yeah. off air there that i like doing radio i'm a sort of yeah uh, radio guy uh not particularly happy about being in front of the camera but i do it because yeah. it's required um, <laughs> and mainly i don't like going on the camera because i look so tired and disheveled all the time i think you look all right mate i, I think you look fine <laughs> oh, okay, well, we'll yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for anybody if you're not why are you not but you know if anybody who's not familiar with mark devlin's work please go and check i think his main central source is the website uh, djmarkdevlin.com and from there you can check out his books uh i have i did have all three of them actually musical truth one two and three i lent volume three to a friend of mine and i never got it back so i've got to re-get that, <laughs> re oh, cool. that well so. funnily enough yesterday yeah. i just released my latest book which is this oh yes one. Uh, gift and uh, uh, the, the gift curse. and the curse that's my truth fiction novel yeah so the official release date for that was yesterday which was 9th of november 9 11 right. so uh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's and that's a follow-up isn't it to um is it the Wars curse and the... yeah 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 that's right yeah please people check those out yeah and uh Check out Mark's Good Vibrations podcast as well. There's so much that you've got. As a, there's a, just an absolute wealth of material there. Interviews, your own material as well. And yeah, that's um, right. I, I really encourage people. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Mm. Absolutely encourage people to check it out because it's it, you will not be disappointed, and it will really give you some uh, interesting perspectives on the world if you're not already clued in on these things. So, which we very much need nowadays, don't we? We really do. Well, Crazy yeah. times we live in. It's a different world to the one that I used to live in. Mm. Uh, going back 20 years, I was a full-time DJ. So I was going up and down the UK playing gigs all over the place, uh, internationally as well. And it's very similar to what I'm doing now because I play gigs all over the place now and I'm traveling internationally again. But now I'm delivering empowering information, mm -hmm. truthful information, which is going to uplift and inspire people, hopefully. Yeah. Whereas back in those days, I was just dropping tunes in clubs and it was all about parties and uh, not a whole lot else. So <laughs> my life is a bit more meaningful these days, at least. I think it's one of those things where because. There, there, there is quite a degree of overlap, actually, in terms of the, the research that you do and the research I do. It's different specialities. Yeah. That yours is music mainly. Uh, there are yeah. Lots of other areas as well, but that's that's a specialised area. And with me, it's sort of like uh, the movies and TV shows and particularly science fiction. As I see from your background. But, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there is a lot of overlap. There is a lot of overlap. Well, there is, and, yeah. And, you know, we quite often come across things, don't we? You and I have sort of sent things backwards and forwards to each other over the years, you know, of things that we've come across and um that kind of nicely leads us into what we're going to talk about today as well the uh the film metropolis from i think it was 1927 wasn't it and That's um, right. yeah nearly 100 years ago incredible yeah yeah and the date that the film is set is 2026 as well which is literally just around the corner for us now well i didn't so, actually realize that yeah yeah it's interesting you saying about how things have changed because certainly i think metaphorically and in terms of fiction and things like that that like the more things change the more they stay the same in some respects because there's a lot of things going on in this film which could be applied to the world we're, we're living in today i suppose really yeah Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's mm. the reason I wanted to talk about this particular mm. movie, because it tells us so much about the times in which we're living now. And this mm. is what I find so incredible, because it was made so long ago. Mm -hmm. and yet we recognize so many of the agendas being pushed and the symbolism and the research that the likes of you and I and so many others have been doing in recent years. And it's all yeah. there. And it just mm -hmm. indicates knowledge of subject areas that we're just getting into now in recent times which were obviously there within so-called elite circles a mm -hmm. hundred years ago and, and way, yeah, way beyond yeah, yeah. that as well so this movie came from fritz lang mm -hmm. the writer and director he was a german occultist so he was into you know the works of uh famous occultists of the time 
yeah, and yeah. Uh, esoteric studies and such. And also he was a Freemason. And mm. so much of his sort of arcane occult knowledge was obviously encoded into this film. Oh, definitely, yes. <laughs> yeah. And it was a monumental undertaking. This film took apparently 17 months to make, which is quite a long time for a mm. movie. And when you look at it, you consider the amount of extras, the amount of people uh, involved, that would have taken a hell of a lot of arranging and directing. So no longer, mm. uh, no, no wonder it took so long. And um, yeah, it's on an absolutely epic scale, which is all the more incredible for the time in which it was made. Yeah. It's got this futuristic cityscape, which is very reminiscent of the sort of things we're hearing about now. These mm. so-called smart cities, part yeah. of the UN's Agenda 2030, 5G smart grid systems linked to social credit score uh, arrangements and uh, mm. everything linked yeah. uh, via you know, uh, internet and such. These ideas were right there in that movie. You've got flying craft, uh, mm -hmm. going around the high-rise buildings and you've got these sort of high-speed motorways that look very similar to what we've got today and apparently Fritz Lang was inspired by a trip to New York at the time he was yeah yeah and he was amazed by all these high-rise buildings in Manhattan and so he sort of recreated his visions of New York in the uh, cityscape for this movie mm. so uh it's very futuristic in its themes. It's got things like transhuman, transhumanism. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, which is a very major part of the plot, actually. So um, just to give a, a pricey of what film is about. Uh, basically. Yeah, please do. Yeah, because some people might not be familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So um, there are lots of different versions of it, actually. Uh, I think the original version was about two and a half hours long. But as with so many movies, it's been chopped and, and butchered over the years. And you've got various mm. different cuts where they've taken vast swathes of the narrative out. So if people want to watch it, try and track down the original cut, which is about two and a half hours in length. Mm. I think they restored most of it in 2008, didn't they? If I remember rightly. Yeah, yeah I think it was they yeah, got there were various, quite a lot of the old footage back, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, various restorations. There was some hidden, uh, some lost footage, mm. which was recovered and it was quite damaged. Uh, but from a, the point of view of completism, it was sort of uh, pasted back into the original cut. So for mm. anyone that wants to see some of that lost footage, you can probably see that cut as well. Uh, so the basic overview is that you've got this futuristic cityscape. I didn't realize it was set in 2026, but mm. you just enlightened mm. me on that. Uh, that explains a lot because it's really <laughs> similar to a lot of, of what's mm. happening at the moment. Mm. And um, you've got an elite class, so-called who live above ground in these amazing high-rise skyscrapers. And the creator of this city is a guy named Jo Fredersen. Mm. So he's like the, the ultimate uh, elite guy who presides over this city. But then you've got the working class, the laborers, who are toiling away underground on machinery that mm. keeps the city operating. And the city is entirely reliant on this workforce. And at the start of the film, you've got this very memorable scene where you've got one shift of workers about to clock on. And they've all got their heads bowed. They're just completely compliant and subservient. They look like they're completely devoid of spirit because they're just in these uh, mind-numbingly tedious, laborious jobs. And then another shift is just clocking off and they're just coming out the elevator mm. and walking the other way with their heads down. It's a very striking scene. And then you see what happens underground, which is all this machinery, which uh, causes the city to function. You've got the son of Jo Fredersen, who's this um, young guy. Uh, it's known as Freda. Mm. And he doesn't share his father's value system. So very early on, we see that he's someone with a conscience. He's someone with compassion, which gets awakened. Mm. And he's somewhat a disappointment to his father because he doesn't represent those sort of so-called elite values that he has. And this young Freda guy comes across this uh, saintly figure named Maria. Mm. And she's played by Brigitte Helm in a, a very memorable role. Yeah, yeah. Brigitte Helm was about 17 when they started filming. So she was 17 or 18 
in these scenes looks a lot older mm. um, actually quite a beautiful woman uh, mm, i think she was yeah yeah, yeah yeah uh so she appears as maria and she's got this aura about her she's almost this religious sort of type figure and she represents love and compassion and there's a tagline that runs throughout the movie which is the mediator between the head mm. and the hands must be the heart so we yeah some it's interesting of, phrase that isn't it yeah overtones going on there yeah mm -hmm. and so she represents the mediator between the elite ruling class of this city and the working class so freda becomes fascinated by her and he pursues her and eventually falls in love with her um but then his father gets wind of what's going on and there's this secondary storyline involving this crazy inventor this mad scientist mm -hmm. the sort of wiry hair and he looks like the, the yeah. stereotypical crazy scientist and his mm. name is rotwang rotwang yeah <laughs> which translates as uh red cock basically uh, <laughs> and <looked> it up <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what it means mm. and um it turns out that both rotwang and yo Fredersen were in love with the same woman and her name was Hell, H-E-L. So uh, it's probably some signaling going on. And she turns out to be the mother of Freda, but she died apparently giving birth to him. And both these guys were in love with this woman. So Rotwang, the crazy inventor, has made this robot, which is where we get into transhumanism. And we see an image, very striking image of this android type thing sat in a chair. Mm. And uh, in the room is a bloody great pentagram on the floor. Yes. Yeah, yeah. A satanic pentagram. So yeah. that's a symbol that we're all sort of getting used mm. to now. And there it was 100 years ago. And what Wang's idea is that he's somehow transported the spirit or the soul of this woman, Hell, into uh, what's known as the machine man. So this robot is called the Machine Man, even though it sort of embodies a woman. Woman, yeah, yeah. And so Yo Freyderson asks Rotwang to create a version of this Machine Man, this android, based around Maria. So he wants to capture Maria's soul essence and transport it into this robot. And then to put the robot in among the workers, the working class, because... Uh, they've learned of a potential rebellion among the workers. Mm. So the idea is to put Maria in there because all the, the working class look up to her and respect her and uh, are in uh, uh, reverence to her. Yeah. But they want an evil version of Maria uh, who leads them astray. Mm -hmm. And so when they create the robot version of Maria, she looks very different to the original Maria. Oh, yes, uh, definitely. This one looks very dark, and she's got these uh, dark circles around her eyes, like this eyeshadow type thing. And straight away, that made me think of a, a very dark subject area that many of us have looked into lately, which is adrenochrome. Mm -hmm. And we hear that with adrenochrome extraction, it often results in black circles around the eyes. So I don't know if that's what was being hinted at back then, but if it was... That's amazing mm. because it means that agenda was going on in the 1920s. And she's got this thing, uh, this sort of tick where one of her eyes keeps closing. The left eye keeps closing. Uh, I think there's some signaling going on there, maybe mm. symbolizing the left hand path or mm -hmm. the left brain. Um, so she uh, just keeps winking with with this uh, eye with the, the, the black shadow and stuff. And that's how you know it's the robot version of maria and not yeah the so uh she gets sent into the workers below ground and they all believe that she's the real maria and she incites them to rebellion but what's happened is the mad creator rotwang has got his own agenda and he wants to topple or overthrow yo Fredersen, the the top guy in the city and so he set this robot Maria off on her own agenda to destroy this machine, which is known as the heart machine. Mm. So that symbolizes the heart of the city. Uh, without it, the city can't operate. And she uh, incites the workers to destroy this machine. 
and it results in these underground uh, areas becoming flooded and everyone has to come up above ground and uh, children have to be rescued because they're in danger of being swept away by this flood. And uh, all the time, Freda, this young guy, the son of, uh, you know, the, the, the main guy in the city, is pursuing Maria. And um, he thinks that the robot Maria is the real one. <clears throat> the workers eventually turn on her and they tie her to a stake and set her on fire. And Freda is horrified because he thinks it's the real Maria. But as she burns and she's cackling away and laughing and just being completely maniacal, yeah. uh, we, we come to see that it was actually a, a robot after all. And the workers yeah. realize that they've been duped. So uh, I'll just pause there in case you want to jump in with any observations. But that's a basic overview of uh, the plot line there. It's a fascinating story, isn't it? It really is. It's like you say, there's the transhumanism thing there. Obviously, there's things that you pointed out about the the imagery, uh, the pentagram. I noticed quite a few of them, actually. There's, I think, mainly around sort of Rockwang's um, house. It, there was some of the uh, lower level doors had got them on the doors as well. It was on the floor and on the wall behind the robot Maria as well. Um, there was some hand signaling going on as well. I there was. was a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of manifestation of pyramid hand yeah. sign being made by your friends. I mean, we can probably look at some of the symbolism first before we go off into any other areas, because mm. I just thought some of it was fascinating. Some of the numerology in it as well, like just little things like you notice in the lift numbers and things like that. I kept finding multiples of 11s and 6s and things like that when you added up yeah. all the numbers of the lift Wasn't numbers. 51, I think. 51, yeah, 51 things the, like uh, that. Yeah. Maybe Quite think a few... of Area 51 in Nevada, you know, this underground. Yeah, place. yeah. Just like, of uh, uh, course, obviously, there's the the machine, the Moloch as well. That's, an, that's another big one, isn't oh, it? Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. We've got a couple of dark themes really going cool, on there. So cool on one, um, yeah. there's a point where Freda starts hallucinating and he's having these nightmarish visions. And mm. he sees the heart machine turning into Moloch, this figure out of, uh, you know, ancient mythology. Mm hmm. Uh, to which children were evidently sacrificed. And um, yeah, he just has these terrifying visions of this machine turning into this uh, entity. And devour, devouring the workers. Yeah, yeah. It's devouring just, the workers, yeah. The, it's the ritual sacrifice, isn't it? You know, and like yep, you say, yep. this. So, and of course, the Saturn worship aspects of Moloch as well, you know, that's all about ritual sacrifice as well. So yeah, yeah. that's right. Sorry, yeah. And, and then a bit later in the movie, He's in bed uh, because he's hallucinating and he's sort of had to be like hospitalized and he keeps mm. waking up in bed uh, with a start with these terrifying visions. And he's seeing Maria, who by this point is the robot Maria, uh, having turned into the whore of Babylon. Mm. And yeah. She's representing yeah. that imagery. Yeah, I've got a lot of so, notes on that. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's biblical overtones. There's a mm. lot of... Um, you know, this esoteric spiritual imagery that we're all quite familiar with now. Mm, mm. Um, and again, uh, it's just incredible to me that that knowledge was being displayed almost a century ago. And very mm. few in the film going audience would have been familiar with this symbolism and known what it meant. I would probably suggest. not. No, no. Only really high level adept occultists with some very advanced knowledge would be able to recognize these themes. Mm. But they're all in there. One of the things that I thought was interesting with, with the time and the sort of the cubism, the surrealism, um, the expressionism, sort of that that art movement at, at, at that point in time, which is clearly in the film, isn't it? You know, and, and Fritz Lang was clearly inspired by all that sort of style of doing things as well. Mm -hmm. And Echo as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how much you've looked into it. I mean, only a cursory for me, but sort of how certain elite types steered those art movements as well of course you know and moved so much of that symbolism into that esoteric occult symbolism into that sort of movement art movement yeah it's 1927 but it's portraying a scene which looks very modern very contemporary to these mm. times mm. Uh, that city just looks like uh, a city that we have these days mm. Mm. Uh, so yeah i'm just astounded by how long ago that thing was made and Obviously, yeah. ev everyone involved in it is now deceased. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but what an incredible legacy was left behind. I'm not mm. entirely sure what Fritz Lang's intentions were, 
whether it was to sort of uplift or uh, educate humanity in some way and communicate empowering information, or mm. whether it was uh, some sort of a cult mockery of the apparent profanity or ignorance of the masses, uh, whether it was revelation of the method in some way, you know, which they like to do, place I, in I, plain sight. I don't know yeah. what his intentions were behind mm. putting that movie out. Uh, evidently, it was a, a bloody pain in the ass to make. It took so yeah, long. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. It cost the equivalent of twenty-one million pounds mm. in money, and um, the studio must have been very frustrated with how long it was taking to get out. I believe uh, it, it bankrupted the company, didn't it? I, if I'm right, I believe it bankrupted the uh, UAF. Was it the company that made it? Um, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it still stands up today. It's quite surprising, actually, in terms of how it looks. And it's undoubtedly it's inspired things like Blade Runner and films like that, you know, with the cityscapes and all that, that sort of, um, yeah. yeah. Going I back to your so. point you, you're making about the, 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 what it was that he was trying to convey. I, I completely agree with you, all of those things. I think it's probably all of those things as well. But one of the things that I, I picked up on there was the sociopolitical thing as well. The timing of when it was being made in Germany, sort of just leading up to that point with, um, uh, Hitler and all that, you know, that kind of thing. One of the fiercest critics of the time was the Communist Party uh, in Russia, I think it was, because they it was sort of ardently socialism aspect to it that was coming from it. I think you yeah. can see the socialism in it, can't you? Um, well, you can, particularly in that opening scene where the uh, working crowds are mm. getting ready to log on for their shift and they all yeah. look the same. They were wearing yeah. these flat caps, which are very yeah. reminiscent of Soviet Russia. Yeah. Um, and it's quite communistic in nature in terms of what's being portrayed. Which is, yeah, which is strange that the Communist Party would have uh, would have been quite critical of it, you know. So, yeah, well, well, make of that what you would. Close to the truth, maybe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. What yeah. we've got portrayed there is exactly the same dynamic that we have in society today, which is absolutely. a, a yeah. working class, effectively a slave class, mm -hmm. uh, subservient to the elite ruling class and completely mm. reliant upon them. But then again, the elites are completely reliant upon the workers because they can't survive without them. Yeah. Uh, but society in that movie is structured pretty much in the same way as it still is. Because oh, absolutely. Majorly. We've had movements, socialism and communism and mm. uh, whatever fascism, whatever labels you want to put on it. Mm. But the same structure in human society is is with us today because yeah. It takes something very radical to ever change that. Yeah, yeah. When you look at the, um, I, because of one of the the reason why I wanted to tie that to that as well was because I've noticed with a lot of the sort of I don't like the term, but the sort of wokey type stuff that's around at the moment, as they call it. You know, I'm not particularly fond of that word, but uh, um, how a lot of that has got esoteric symbolism in it as well. That sort of extreme left um, socio political thinking. There's a lot of history, a lot yeah. of occult symbolism attached to that as well. So yeah. those things going hand in hand with Metropolis or all that time back as well. You know, so it's again, it's one of those things. It never it's always there, isn't it? You know, it's yeah. Yeah. When you become symbol literate, you see this stuff everywhere. Mm, mm. When you learn to spot these signs and symbols mm. and sigils and icons and motifs, then you do tend to spot it. You know, you can go back decades and watch yeah. old movies and you're like, oh, my days. Look, they're just. Yeah, yeah. Them. A, a symbol there that I've only just learned about, and all mm. those decades ago, there it was. Mm. So, um, yeah, there, there obviously was a, a very uh, potent reason for this movie to get put out mm. against mm. all the odds. Mm. And uh, as I say, we can puzzle as to what the true motives yeah. were. But uh, I, it's just you mentioning it, work. absolutely, absolutely. You mentioned um, before about the 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 tagline. The mediator between bread, uh, brain and hand must be the heart. Yeah. yeah. That midsection where it goes into sort of all the biblical stuff mm -hmm. and it, it ties in again to the um, the Scarlet Woman, the, the Babylon ritual, all that kind of stuff. And yeah. the Tower of Babel comes into it as well. And of course, mm -hmm. that was about people's inability to communicate with each other, right. which I thought was a fascinating idea in it as well, because you have these groups of people that even mm -hmm. though they're living together and they talk about the mediator, but they can't reach any common ground, can they? Yeah. And that's a religious uh, motif, a mm. mediator. So you could take something like Christianity and uh, Christians are told that the only way to 
God to heaven to salvation is through Jesus, the figure of Jesus. So he's the mediator. And mm. it's the same thing with many other religions, you know, Krishna in Hinduism and such. And when there's this talk of the mediator between the head, which is represented in the movie by the elite class, Yo Fredersen, mm. and the hands, which are the workers, yeah. uh, being the heart, it made me think of the middle way that we hear mm -hmm. of in Buddhism. Yeah. Uh, you know, supposedly Buddha taught that uh, the way to salvation is the middle way to walk that middle path. I remember watching the movie uh, Little Buddha with Keanu mm. Reeves many years ago. Great movie. Good film, taught yeah. Me, taught me a lot about, you know, Buddhist beliefs. Mm. And I just remember that talk of the middle way. And that seems to be something else that's getting conveyed here with the yeah. idea of the mediator. The interesting thing about the robot Maria or the machine mm. man is that it's inspired so many music artists yeah and uh it's almost as if every major pop artist of the last 15 to 20 years has at some point appeared in robotic form android form very much based around the machine man at a metropolis yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, madonna's done that mm. Beyonce has appeared on stage as this robot thing uh lady gaga i think britney spears has done it mm -hmm. it just seems to be a a prerequisite of uh, yeah. being a successful pop artist now mm. so again that's another lasting legacy of this movie just that um android idea mm. and it was very clearly communicating transhumanism you know uh rot wang is transferring the soul energy of maria into this android thing uh, mm. interestingly she still survives so she doesn't die you still have the uh, the genuine original the genuine one yeah yeah who, who survives to the end of the movie but you've also got this robot version of her where uh, her likeness has been transported in it and and that's the central idea of transhumanism you know mm -hmm. the, the marrying together of humanity and machinery technology so those ideas were around almost 100 years ago Mm. And uh, maybe that's why we see so many depictions of Android robot uh, from Metropolis, because oh, yeah. this is a very big agenda that's being pushed now. AI, transhumanism, this total reliance on technology to do everything. It's a major part of the elite agendas, and uh, it clearly has been for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Interesting you mentioning about those those particular pop stars as well, because as you and I know, there's a lot of allusions to sort of mind control and triggers and things like that and i and i thought about the two uh you know the robot and the and the original maria the the real maria and it's almost like alters the way you described it before the expressions it's almost like a um dissociate you know different personalities that kind of thing as well yeah it is so you've got the two versions of maria and there are allusions there, as you say, to mind control, where you've got dissociative identity disorder, multiple mm. personality disorder. You have these alters that are created as a result of MK Ultra style mind control experimentation, trauma based yeah. mind control. So that seems to have been a theme in it as well. Mm. So you've got these two different versions of Maria. Um, I actually found the sort of um, the bad Maria to be uh quite uh attractive and sexy actually uh, which, I, <laughs> which is <laughs> it's probably a dark twisted side of me coming through but uh, <laughs> yeah i did find her um quite attractive uh brigitte helm uh she was quite interesting because uh she went on to have loads and loads of car accidents she yes. was reportedly a yeah. really bad driver yeah. and there was one incident where she uh reportedly killed somebody uh, wow. in a in a road accident and she she got off but uh you know really terrible driver and she didn't do many films after metropolis uh, she grew very disillusioned with uh the nazi party which was gaining momentum in germany in the 1930s and she felt that the film industry of the time was very strongly linked to the nazi party mm -hmm no part in it so she kind of stepped away from the industry didn't do many films didn't do many interviews beyond that uh but yeah very interesting woman mm. similar thing happened with fritz lang as well didn't it because he um they they loved his stuff and they wanted to use it for propaganda um obviously he left and went to america you know right yeah i didn't know what happened to him after that. Mm. i can't remember when he died i think it was um in the 70s something like that 1976 i think something like that so yeah, yeah his career kind of but even so you know i mean after the fact there's some strange films i don't know if you've ever seen m 
the one with Peter Lorre, the child killer. No, no. I've mm, seen that. Very, very dark film. <laughs> I'll, mm. I won't go into too much detail because obviously this will go up on YouTube and YouTube right. doesn't like certain subjects being talked about. But yeah. yeah, that is a very dark and disturbing film. That was That's a Fritz Lang one. I think that was 1933. So mm. um, yeah, I don't know much more about what else he did. Uh, you're obviously way, way more clued up on movies than me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm someone that I, I do love movies, but I'm very picky about mm. the ones that I uh, choose to watch. Mm. I'm not a big fan of blockbusters. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, science fiction, to be honest. I, right. I just okay. don't, 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 don't get inside most of it. But every now and again, I just find a film that absolutely captivates me and fascinates me, and mm. I study it endlessly. And um, I dearly love films like that, that just have mm. that special something about them. Mm. And Metropolis uh, definitely fits the bill. Mm. I first saw it many, many years ago, didn't understand the symbolism, uh, but there was just something special about it. I knew that it had been used by Queen. Mm. Radio Gaga, yeah. Radio Gaga. So maybe we should get into the music side of things. Mm, can do, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I remember watching the video to Radio Gaga by Queen which came out in early 1984 of all years, go figure, mm -hmm. from their album The Works. Uh, and The Works makes me think of, you know, that underground machinery. That machinery, was yeah. The city. yeah. And um, they've got a track on that album, actually, called Machines and Back to Humans. Mm. And it's about transhumanism. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The video to Radio Gaga, which was the first single from that album, you've got the group, Queen, uh, transposed into scenes from Metropolis. So they're in this flying craft, sort of going around the, the city, flying around these skyscrapers and stuff. And evidently the group was very into the movie Metropolis. Mm. Uh, my studies into Queen have demonstrated to me that the driving force behind that group was Brian May. He was the Mercury. big science, yeah, he was a big science fiction fan as well. So yeah, yeah, that, yeah. well he's that a tracks, he's yeah. Astrophysicist, mm. so called these days. Mm. Um <laughs> reincarnation of Sir Isaac Newton, I think. Uh, looking at him. <laughs> but Brian May was always the driving force behind Queen. And I've put together a presentation actually, which I've not delivered yet. I was supposed right, to do okay. it in Newcastle the other week, but I haven't done it publicly yet and it's called dark occult aspects of queen so i've really gone into that group right. and it would appear that they were quite fascinated by occult ideas and i think most of this was coming from brian may mm. so brian mm. may appears to be the one that was very much into the ideas being put forward by metropolis and it was probably his idea to mm. base the video around that so that same year 1984 there was a, a new soundtrack to that movie that was made mm. by Giorgio Moroder. Yeah, yeah. So the original Metropolis was a silent movie. It had captions mm. in German, but you can also get a version where it's translated into English. Uh, but then there was a music soundtrack put to it in 1984 by Giorgio Moroder, this amazing Italian producer who worked out of Munich. He was the producer of Donna Summer's I Feel Love. Mm. Which was a landmark piece of work great great piece of music whatever people might say about mm -hmm. Giorgio Baroda and yeah I, I really well, he, was, think he was an amazing musician mm -hmm. you know great mm -hmm. great producer mm -hmm. and he put together this soundtrack which featured Freddie Mercury there was a song called Love Kills which came out later that year and it had mm -hmm. Adam Ant and various other uh, contemporary artists at the time mm -hmm. and so Metropolis was kind of restored and there was a color version of it with this new soundtrack added and Queen were a part of that whole project. So I think that's the first time I came across it actually in 84. It was with me as well. Yeah. I, I remember distinctly remember seeing it being shown at school. So I'm yeah. giving my age away a little bit now. I think it was about nine, something like that. Um, so yeah, yeah, I remember it. they put it on at school for us this one day, oh, end wow. of term type thing or something like that. And it was the, it was the, the colorized musical version. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That would have been my first exposure to it as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Cause I was into queen at the time and I liked that Freddie Mercury track. And uh, I heard about this Giorgio Moroda soundtrack and mm. I was like, Oh, what's this movie? So yeah, that must've been the first time I saw it. And um, yeah, there's just been different versions of it. And as I say, it's inspired many music makers as well, because the scenes from Metropolis and there's ideas and themes which have cropped up in many music videos over the years, mm -hmm. particularly that uh, robot Android thing. Mm, absolutely. I wonder as well if we might talk a little bit about, because 
it's just an area that I'm fascinated in, but it's also an area that you probably have a lot of insight into as well, is the the ritual of the the Scarlet Woman, the blah blah work, and all that, which is heavily talked about in this in Metropolis, isn't it? And the the illusion is that the the bad Maria is like the evocation of the Scarlet Woman as well, you know, riding in on the beast with the eight heads, is it, and all that kind of thing, you know. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. And I'm fascinated that with that because of the whole jack parsons l ron hubbard out in the desert doing their rituals based on crowley stuff you know and as a sci-fi fantasy guy as well you know love my twin peaks and that's david lynch's thing you know and that's all about that kind of stuff as well you know but it's really heavily there with all these pop stars isn't it as well and the, and the music you yeah. know that whole thing well i guess the evocation of the scarlet woman there the whore of babylon mm. was the equivalent from those times of what we get now with these big music events like the u.s super bowl halftime mm. show the grammys the mtv vmas those events in these times have become mass energy harvesting occult yeah. rituals they're watched by millions and millions of people around the world and they get more and more occult and satanic with every <laughs> yeah. passing year if you know what you're looking for they do, and yeah. every time you think they've taken it as far as they possibly can and get away with it they go even further the next year just look at sam smith's performance oh, at the this year yeah you know it's a blatant display Ooh. of satanism yeah yeah but if you think about what was getting portrayed in metropolis that was going out to the audiences of the time which would only have been a fraction of the numbers that we now have, mm. that anyone going to the cinema in the 1920s to watch that movie was witness to these occult rituals. And they were giving their attention to it. And that's one of the reasons why they do these things, because energy goes where attention flows. Attention goes, that's right, so yeah. if you've got millions of people uh, directing their consciousness towards a particular scene or a particular idea or a particular theme, Mm. There's a belief that you can actually help to manifest that and bring it into physical yeah, yeah, within yeah. Uh, cult traditions. And so that would have been the the contemporary version of what we now see at things like the Super Bowl and all the rest. Yeah, of it. yeah, yeah. Of course, now you've got millions and millions more people that watch these things and are having their energy zapped. Mm. Them, yeah. Uh, and are also possibly having their consciousness and their creativity uh, exploited to to bring about certain ideas. <laughs> no doubt whatsoever absolutely with you on that one yeah no doubt whatsoever yeah that that thing of the the, the imagery though just alone the imagery with the ritual going on i i, I think several years back you and i came on your uh, good vibrations podcast and we talked about the uh, 2012 olympics the ceremonies and that oh yeah and uh, when i did my book about that and i put in all the um how many times you see people dressed up in the in the red garb, you know, Annie Lennox coming in on a, a barge of the dead and Rihanna dressed in the red, you know, all the, they, they do. It's so blatant, isn't it? You know, yeah. it's... well, the 2012 um, Grammys was where Nicki Minaj exorcised she Roman did. Zelansky, this mm. entity that yeah. she said lived within her. She said it's mm. this homosexual male. Uh, Roman Zelansky, obviously based around the film director Roman Polanski, Polanski yeah. but very disturbing because it hints at uh, entity attachment, demonic possession. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, and Nicki Minaj appeared on stage with this guy dressed as the Pope and <laughs> was said to be performing this exorcism. Uh, hang on a minute. Yeah. Wasn't that supposed to be about entertainment? Mm. Aren't the Grammys and all these music shows supposed to be about, you know, just fun? Uh, mm. So why are we getting dark occult rituals being portrayed on stage mm. in front of millions of people? Well, it's because it's not about fun and entertainment, as we know. Not at all. Agendas <laughs> at play here. But yeah, that was disturbing enough. And that was 2012. Mm. I think mm. how much further they've taken everything since then. Mm. It was very interesting hearing you reference Metropolis being based in 2026. Mm. We're obviously very close to that now. And it made me think of the movie Soylent Green. Oh, yeah, that's it's obviously. Uh, I think that's set around about now as well. Um, well, yeah, that I'm not movie exactly when <laughs> was made in 1973, so it's much more modern than mm. uh, Metropolis. I think the book came out in the 1960s. Uh, the mm -hmm. film was made in 1973 with Charlton Heston. Yeah, and 
Interestingly, the storyline to it was set in 2022. Right. I knew it was about now, but I wasn't sure exactly when. Yeah. 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 So the idea was that um, it was set in New York and it had become overcrowded, overpopulated. People were living in extreme squalor. There was a, an extreme shortage of food and there was an extreme disparity between the elite ruling class and mm. the workers, the regular uh, folk. Which is when you when you want some of this stuff. <laughs> oh, well, maybe not, actually. <laughs> or not, as movie, the case may be. I'd give that <laughs> no. one a swerve. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Spo- yeah. <laughs> spoiler alert for anyone that's not seen the movie. Uh, you might want to dip the volume now, but the classic line from it, from Charlton Heston at the end, is, Soylent Green is people. <laughs> so they're using dead bodies... Uh, yeah, I mean, all, all joking aside, source. yeah, it's as, uh... as a food source, yeah, mm. and it's set in 2022. And back in 1973, it was depicting this nightmare, futuristic, dystopian society. Has there ever been a futuristic movie where the society isn't dystopian? Have you ever seen a futuristic movie um... where there's joy and abundance and happiness and everyone's loving life? Doesn't really happen, does it? Not very often. I mean, even the ones that you could sort of call utopian, like maybe some aspects of Star Trek, even that's got a lot of violence with all the other alien races and things like that. So it's right. hardly like a complete out and out utopia. So I think you're probably right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the interesting thing is I've just written this this book, mm. and um, during the process, I just came to realise that the most gripping, the most thrilling stories that are really going to hold an audience's attention are ones where the characters are in extreme peril, where there's danger, uh, where there's violence, where uh, terrible things happen. They are the most interesting stories. Uh, If you try and make a story interesting when it's all about love and abundance and peace and happiness, uh, I don't think it would make for a very interesting story. So that's strange you saying that, you know, because I am actually one of the very few people in the world that is the opposite to that. I, I am really I I'm I will watch things like that, but I generally tend to watch them more sort of for research purposes or looking for the symbolism. I probably have got a few ex- examples of those types of things that I do like, but yeah, I've always been sort of more into the um, peaceful, happy, clappy. Oh well, that's good. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's just me. Good. Maybe it's just me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> most people seem to like the death and the destruction and carnage and chaos. Mm. But with that story, I mean, not 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 to deviate too much. Yeah, I get what you're with, saying. Yeah, yeah. With, with that book, um, I wanted to ultimately end it on a positive, uplifting note. I didn't want mm. violence everywhere and death everywhere. So what I've tried to do is dish out natural law, karmic consequences to each of the characters. So I yeah. think at the end of the story, most readers would agree that every character gets what they deserve based on their chosen behaviours and actions. Right. So uh, that's that's what I've tried to do with that story. But anyway, mm-hmm. that's that aside. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm all for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, that whole uh, thing. Of... Sorry, go on. Yeah. Uh, what were we talking about? Soylent Green. Mm. And we're talking about that... those films that are set in that side of that paradigm, the dystopian future. Yeah. 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 Around these times. So they were putting a year on it and they were saying this storyline is taking place in the 2020s. And here we are. So I remember in Soylent Green, uh, food was so scarce, they've come up with this food sort of synthetic like supplement thing, which is mm. dead bodies, as we'd said. Um, but there's a scene where this guy, I think it's, is it Charlton Heston's cop character? He takes a spoon of strawberry yeah. jam. Oh, yeah, yeah. We sit with Edward G. Robinson. and Edward G. Yeah. Robinson, yeah. It's an yeah. absolute delicacy, just yeah. a spoon yeah, yeah. of strawberry jam, because uh, mm. only the rich can afford that. Mm. And so that's the nightmarish uh, future that was predicted. Mm. Mm. And then you've got Edward G. Robinson, who volunteers to go into oh, this euthanasia yeah. program, yeah. Uh, where you get these few moments of absolute pleasure and bliss before you bow out of this world yeah yeah. and then they end up using the bodies but um yeah that was a pretty pretty dark element Mm, absolutely yeah absolutely it's quite interesting how a lot of these films that we we were talking about whether they were sort of set late 60s early 70s early 80s even they tend to sort of fall around about now 
in terms of their prediction dates, don't they? I mean, just like Blade Runner, I think is twenty nineteen. I think that that was predicting that that. Yeah. Um, and that's another one has got the scarcity thing as well, because um, you know they no one can have real animals. You know, they're all artificial animals, like the replicants, humans, which is transhumanism as well. And I think there's a conversation in the film about, um, do you think I'd be able to afford a, a, a real animal? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So again, it's that I, idea, I think, isn't it? I think there might be some good news here in that these filmmakers were obviously very clued in. You know, people like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, they know the score. They know mm. what, what the agendas are. Stanley Kubrick knew what was going on mm, I, pers absolutely. I personally feel that kubrick was uh trying to wake humanity up oh absolutely yeah i think he was an exception to the rule yeah there are i yeah. think there are a few exceptions to the rule yeah i think kubrick yeah. was uh pretty upset with the so-called elite ruling class uh mm. he never really uh, joined their ranks he was always on the periphery of it and there's a lot in his movies to suggest that he was trying to communicate oh. what their agendas were i yeah. personally feel that he was knocked off they got rid of him mm. when Eyes Wide Shut was about to be released and we yeah. hear that there was 20 minutes of footage that was cut. That's that right. He's never seen. Uh, and seemingly he just went too far and they thought, mm. oh, no, we just we can't have this guy around anymore communicating this stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, most of these filmmakers know what the agendas are. Oh, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I think that, um, as you said, so many of them are set in these times, the 2020s. And they probably did feel at the time as if society would be very close to the sort of things being portrayed in these movies. Mm, mm. And um, the fact that we are some way away from that still is possibly some means for optimism because uh, yeah, it may be in some way we've managed to stem the tide and we've managed to push back on these things because i personally feel that these elite agendas so-called should be much further on than they currently are according to their plans according to documents they've put out and particularly mm. according to the clues they put into tv shows and movies mm. i think they considered that by 2023 on the cusp of 2024 we'd be a lot closer to what we've seen portrayed in many of these movies and, yeah uh, yeah we're not the pushback has, I, I undoubtedly, uh, the pushback has derailed some of it. Um, Maybe may delayed. I want to try and be optimistic about it and say that it's uh, derailed it as opposed to delayed it. Yeah. Look, look, mate. I mean, I've just got back from Australia. I got into Australia without a hitch. I did four talks communicating the information that I talk about, and I got back out again. Mm. In 2020, that was impossible. Yeah, and you probably didn't think it ever would be possible exactly, at that point exactly. in time. In 2020, yeah. I thought, well, that's it. You know, yeah, I'm on yeah, British yeah. shores for the rest of my life because mm. I'm never going to be able to travel again. But I did. And that's I it. think that's only because there's been pushback. There's been mm. resistance. Mm. If everyone had sat on their asses and just put up with it, I mean, many did. Uh, but if everyone yes, had done that, then yeah. we'd, we'd be in a very terrible state by now. Oh, I think the yeah. fact that we've still got some relative freedoms of movement mm. uh, is testament to the power of large numbers of people pushing back and making a very clear statement that they're not having it. Because these elite agendas are becoming very obvious now. Oh, it's, yes. It's yeah. in their own writings. It's in their own documents. They feel the need to communicate it, not just symbolically in movies, which they love to do. But they actually come right out and tell you what they're doing. Mm. Like Schwab put a bloody book out telling you about mm. how he wants to enslave you. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think so many people have got wise to this now that it mm. has created a significant resistance. And those who have been pushing back have actually saved the hides of all the bloody masses that have sat around doing nothing. And they don't even realize it. No, no, they don't know. No. No, they don't they look even at, realize what a they think place, crazies and what a conspiracy theorist would be in mm -hmm. if, yeah, if yeah. all of us had done nothing, and they probably yeah. never realized that. So, is there anything else you wanted to throw onto the table, maybe before? Uh, well, not really. I think I've mentioned all the the main themes that I wanted to in the movie. Okay. I just recommend that everyone watches it. Mom. Anyone that's got an interest in <clears throat> occult studies, uh, arcane knowledge symbolism and uh themes that we're seeing getting expressed in society now should yeah. just have a look at this movie yeah. and just consider how long ago it was made 
what knowledge was quite clearly there and uh, maybe watch it in two goes because it's a long movie you know mm, uh, mm. And, and just really study it and i just think everyone owes it to themselves too mm, absolutely to yeah yeah what i shall do as well because there's there's lots of other little things that i picked up um as i was watching it but i'll throw some images up on on this video as well when i edit it so people can have a look at maybe if we don't necessarily mention them but at least people can um sort of intuit what it's about i noticed little things like in the cathedral where maria's doing her sort of sermon and there's like a, the shape of an eye an all-seeing eye behind her made out of the shapes of the candles little things like that as well yeah thank you so yeah. much mark for well, coming on right, and mate. doing this i really really appreciate it it's uh yeah, no worries that was hopefully. a different kind of conversation for me because normally i mm. speak about music and uh how entertainment has been weaponized and such. I don't really get into movies much, but I really enjoyed the conversation. It was really Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm glad you did. Yeah, it's uh, I have as well. Yeah, definitely. It's been a great discussion and I hope people will get something out of it. And um, again, if people want to check out Mark's stuff, please go and visit uh, djmarkdevlin.com. Is there anything else that you've got coming up at the moment that you want to let people know about or anything like that? That to uh... Well, if I may be allowed another shameless plug. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I've just put this out and it's the sequel to the novel that I published in 2019, self-published, The Cause and the Cure. So it's many of the same characters. The original story was set in the early 90s in Oxford, which is where I grew up. And of course, the 90s was the best decade of all, just incredible times. Uh, but this story is set in 2001. So it's 10 years on and it's against the backdrop of... Uh, 9-11 attacks and the characters discover that there's a plot to have oxford's very own 9-11 event oh, so right. that's the overall theme of the book um i really enjoyed the process of writing fiction so i've written three non-fiction books but uh i have discovered that i enjoy writing novels more mm. because you can really explore your own imagination you can literally have anything happen that you want to happen you can put any words that you want into the characters mouths and the greatest thing about it is there's plausible deniability so yes. i call it <laughs> truth fiction mm. so in these books there's a whole load of truth bombs and mm. it all checks out but if anyone ever challenged me on it and said, what are you make, doing making these crazy claims? You can't say that. I can say, well, chill out, man. You know, it's fiction. It's a work of Come fiction. On, yeah. 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 <laughs> actually, you're giving people a great deal of empowering truth mm. dressed mm. up as fiction, which is a great way to do it. I mean, that's mm. what they do in the movies, right? It is. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You, you know, you turn yeah. on the BBC Evening News, you think you're getting truth. All you're getting is lies and deception, mm. and propaganda. Mm. Then you go to the cinema and you think, oh, this is wild escapism and imagination. And actually, you're getting programmed. You're it's getting told the truth. I think it's the occult reversal. I absolutely do. I think it's the occult reversal. You know, exactly. what they tell you is the truth is a lie and what the lie is the truth. You know, it's exactly. a... so they put all kinds of truths in movies. And usually it's for, I would suggest, not entirely benevolent uh, oh, no. purposes. But there are then, some exceptions, like we say, Kubrick yeah, and people like Kubrick, that, you know, but, yeah. but, but yeah. I, I think in a lot of cases, they're mocking us, mm -hmm. uh, they're rubbing our noses in it, they're telling us what's coming. So I put a lot of truth in my novels, but my truth is uh, supposed to be empowering and uplifting and it's it's helpful to people that's good uh, it, it's benevolent in its intent yeah yeah uh so that's why i enjoyed the process of it uh, so much uh i would love it to be made into a film that would be <laughs> but it's probably never gonna happen you never know never say never uh, all right other than that thanks for getting me on i really appreciate thank you i really appreciate it. hopefully we'll do it again at some point yeah yeah and uh, if i do sure. manage to get this video edited in time i will just say that uh if you're in my neck of the woods uh mark will be speaking in lichfield at uh the social club um yep. on wednesday the wednesday 15th. the 15th yeah 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 kicking Is off the... at about 7 p.m yeah hopefully i will try and get it i will try and get it edited in time get it up before then but um is it that the talk is the occult aspects of the beatles and the rolling stones is that right yep so i've got two talks uh dark occult aspects of the beatles and dark occult aspects of the rolling stones mm. so I've kind of started this series, as I say, I've just done the one on Queen and I'm probably going to go band by band for mm. the rest of my natural life. OK, please go over to Mark's channel, like, share, subscribe and that on YouTube. 
um mark devlin is it just mark devlin the channel called uh it's dj mark devlin dj mark devlin right okay yeah 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 i was thinking more of the youtube channel as well and things like that but you've obviously got platforms on BitChute and odyssey as well yeah i mean i've had had three youtube channels deleted yeah my fourth so i use BitChute, odyssey and rumble okay so there's all that there yeah yeah Yeah. okay then all right Right, great stuff uh you take care of yourself thank you so much everybody for watching as well and i will see you again very very soon bye bye for now yes